One of my favorite things to do every morning, or especially after like I had a party the previous day, is to log on to Reverb and see what all did I miss. Is there a rare piece that I've always been looking for? Something I didn't know I was looking for? Or perhaps an extraordinary example of an ordinary guitar? Today, I'm going to take you guys on that journey with me. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. All right, let's go ahead and start things off here. The first one is a 1976 Gibson S1. This is essentially this company's take on a Stratocaster. And while I generally prefer the Marauders, the S1 is technically just a hair tad bit more rare. But I had to click on this one this morning because it looked like they were advertising it as like being ultra clean, super collector's condition. I mean, with a price tag of $4,000, it sure as heck better be. Generally, these are like $1,500 plus or minus $500, depending on a whole bunch of factors. But we've got Schaller strap locks on it, which, okay, it's not that big of a deal to replace error correct buttons. But uh-oh, our nut has also been replaced. It's kind of an interesting compensated nut. It looks very strange. Kind of reminds me of the late 80s Gibson locking nut system like you find on the SG Elite. And oh, we've got locking spursal tuners on this one too. Maybe this is more so player's grade. However, to be fair, it looks like this originally had Clusens, so you could put them back on and nobody would ever be the wiser. However, if you remove the tuners that you've restored to it, you might still be able to see an outline of the Spurzels. But here's another cool thing about the Marauder S1 series. Not only are they a bolt-on neck, but they're also a scarf joint. Yes, there are legit Gibsons out there with scarf joints. If you don't know what we're talking about, it's right here. Basically, they took these necks and they just slapped these headstocks on them, which are flying V in style. But they were multi-piece construction like that. But this one's got some cool wood grain. And it appears to be in okay shape. Well, until you see a big ding over here. But ooh, nice. He's got some original marketing materials here. You want to know what's crazy, though? Zoom in on this one. That S1 has neck binding. I know there's Marauder customs out there, but they had fancier inlays. And I was always hoping there was an S1 custom out there, and I think I found a new holy grail I need to find. Perhaps I need to contact Ronnie here. See, that's why I love doing this guitar hunting every morning, even if I don't record it. Sure, this listing ended up being a bust, it's crazily overpriced, but I learned something new. Our next one, I don't really want to show you guys this one, because I'm kind of interested. So it says, Gibson Les Paul Custom 1992. What caught my attention is the Super 400 inlays. I've documented a black version of this. There was an ebony and a white one. And I've been looking for clean examples of each to hold back in my personal collection because these are really cool pre-custom shop, custom specced out Les Paul Customs. How many times can you say the word custom, right? <laughs> but the condition looks okay from these leading photos. Not too much gold wear. And then we flip it over to the back. Yes, we can see our custom shop edition decal. That only meant it was a limited edition, either for a dealer, it was a catalog guitar, but generally you'll find more than one of them made. This is actually a series that's been pretty well documented. However, the, the photo quality is so bad, it almost looks like it has a TV white finish to it. Like you can almost kind of see some wood grain here, but sadly, We've only got two photos to go off of. I mean, it looks like we've got strap locks on it. And for the most part, everything else looks stock. Like you've got the correct style tuners on here. It's got the correct case for this era. Here's the other thing. Two photos listed at what I consider top market value for this particular guitar at this time. Not necessarily overpriced, but it's also an international listing. And, you know, if something's wrong with this guitar, once it arrives to wherever you are, it's really hard to get it to go back if it was improperly described. So I'm going to have to message these guys because I would not mind owning that if it's as clean as they're saying it is. Future Trogly here. This, this right here is why you get additional photos. Unfortunately, this example has some extreme finish checking on it. And unless this is an alder neck, that means moisture damage. Or this was not stored properly its entire life. That's a shame. Now you could refinish the front of this headstock to make it look good again, or you could appreciate it for what it is. But sadly, my search continues. Next up, a listing from Japan by Blue Guitars. So this is one of those Guitar of the Week guitars. If you don't know what that is, check this episode out. I'll tell you about every single week of Guitar of the Week. And this is another one I've been recently collecting because I just think having a complete Guitar of the Week collection would be cool. But this is the last one of the series. And the hard part about this collection is I want them to be in pretty clean condition. I'll take a few nicks and dings here and there, but nothing like on the top because that's just how I am. If I'm going to hold guitars for 50 plus years, they might as well be the cleanest ones I can find. But having the silver burst finish is kind of cool, even though the RD didn't originally come in that color and these have dirty fingers pickups. It was just kind of an amalgamation of all the 70s specs that are deemed cool at this point in time. 
2500 bucks. I mean, that's a fair market price. But it looks like they're saying it might have more wear than maybe the photos lead on. And in my experience, guys, if you're a collector buying out of Japan, used things are generally in much worse condition than the photos make it look. And that's especially true on like 70s and 80s models. It's gotten so bad to the point where I just don't buy like real vintage stuff out of Japan. But brand new stuff, yeah, we have a great time documenting all that stuff on the show. But now the poster child of today's episode. I'm really, really hoping after I read the description that this is a custom thing because I read 1970 Gibson SG Standard. It's blue. It's got the trapezoid inlays. It's got a B5 Bigsby on it that kind of looks stock. But I'm really scared that this is a refinished version of one of these bad boys because generally 1970, it would have the full bat wing pick guard. You would have some sort of a vibrola. But if somebody were to refinish the guitar, you could hide the sins of the additional screws and all the other stuff. That's the other fun thing I like to do. Before I read the description, I like to go through these photos to kind of test myself to see what I think it is. So we've got the really flat SG body, so I think they might have the year approximately right. I mean, there's quite a bit of carving to this. It's got the ABR1 bridge. <sighs> This is weirding me out. I've never seen that in 1970. It almost looks like they just chopped up an original pick guard. I mean, the spacing looks very slightly off. Those tuners are definitely replaced. Headstock looks a bit goofy, but sometimes they just do. That serial number, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say this has definitely been refinished. Okay, there I'm seeing what I need to see. They're definitely within the correct era, but I believe it's been refinished and reworked. So let's read our description. There we go. A killer refinished Pelham Blue 1970 SG standard. So they're saying replace nut tuners, pick guard, Bigsby installed by prior owner. But okay, at least it still has the original patent numbered humbuckers and electronics have been replaced with 73 dated pots. Here's the problem with buying remade, refinished vintage stuff, or really of any age, is you don't know what's hiding underneath this paint. I know there's at least some filled in screw holes, but there's no guarantees as far as has it been repaired underneath here because a solid finish hides all sins. And the new 73 pot codes kind of makes me think this was an older restoration project, which at that point in time, converting a bat wing into the 61 style would have been a more desirable effect. The vintage version of this like we're talking early 60s, is more valuable and desirable than the later full guards. But because of School of Rock, I've always liked the full guarded ones. Next up, we've got a push tone. Somebody shared a photo with me of an absolutely gorgeous example of one of these. Like it has a crazy flame top. And I've already reviewed and documented this guitar, so you can check it out in this episode. It was basically a take on the dealer pickup demo guitars, except for they just gave you a P94 and the humbuckers. But this was part of the Guitar of the Month series. So it looks like this one has all the pickups. It appears to be an okay shape. I think that's the configuration I decided on as well. But these are kind of interesting guitars. That's not a bad price. Yep, I'll be putting an offer in on that. Next up, a bucket head. These things have just gone insane in value. I remember when I first started with these, the signatures would generally run between five and 7,000 and the studios were like between two and three. And like nowadays, if you can find one of these for seven grand, like you pick it up, right? 12,000 is a bit much. I mean, unless it's absolutely perfect, I can tell this example has some yellowing to it, but I mean, most of these will have some extent of yellowing, but it looks like we got a little bit of wear right here. But the other thing for me is I don't want the Schaller to version. I prefer the locking Grover because that means it was an earlier one and I just think the Grovers look better. As far as functionality goes, it doesn't matter. So this is available if you're interested. However, I, I think the price is a little bit high for whatever this is. But these are very prone to finish checking and most sellers just don't end up disclosing it. This one intrigued me because it said Jimmy Page number one. So is this the number one model or is it number one of number one? That's why I had to click on this because you just never know. I mean, at 14,000 bucks, I would hope it's number one. That's a quirky spec I didn't know these guys had. Is this custom shop? I don't think I've actually seen the official custom shop version of this. I'm so used to the 90s era ones that were Gibson USAs. You've got a lot of binding bleed going on here, which if you're not familiar, it's the red aniline dyes here kind of bleeding into the binding. It's kind of to be expected and happened on the vintage originals apparently and okay yeah so this is just the number one model not the number one and, Ooh, looks like we got a little bit of steel wool underneath these pickups you should really 
take that off. It's not so good for your pickup. I used to clean my guitars with steel wool, and I still think it's a perfectly fine, acceptable way to do it. I've just found using a metal polish gives you a better result. And it's a little bit less messy. Like, it's messy in a different kind of way. That's a beautiful guitar. And these listings always get me so excited. I love it when it's not a dealer selling the 50s vintage original. So this is just Gibson Les Paul Special by Alex here. Now, sure, you can't be 100% sure it's authentic, but just because you buy from a dealer doesn't mean it's also authentic. It could just be a really good replica. There's pros and cons buying dealer versus private seller. Private seller, you generally get a better deal, but buying from a dealer, you at least have someone you can hold accountable if you need to sue them. This one's in okay shape. I mean, for the age, I mean, it's, it's got a lot to wear, but it appears to have not have been broken. I mean, at first glance, this looks mainly original to me. This is probably the ugliest eyesore of wear. Looks like maybe one replaced knob, and I would argue it's been refretted, but it could be a good player. What's the seller say? Original pots, no cracks, straight neck, good action, original P90 pickups, that's a big thing. I like this custom case that they've got going on for it, but ooh, it's not mentioning the refret. But on a model in this condition, I would actually view that as a plus. And these frets look quite large, so if you wanted somebody to reshape them down to the more vintage style, you could do that. But if you ever need help looking at a guitar, getting my opinion on it, I do offer private help sessions on my website. So it's a win-win-win. I make a little bit of money for my time, you're confident on your purchase, and the seller doesn't have to deal with a headache because you know all the information up front, so you can make an offer accordingly. Next up, we've got a goddess. I should have never talked about these things. Like, these never sold for three grand until I sold my Violet Burst. I mean, before then, they were like 1800 max. So I take full responsibility of these things being sillily priced. But what's going on there? It's like our serial number has been erased, but normally they don't have die in them. That's strange. Sometimes that can just be photo editing software because they don't want to have the serial number listed publicly. But it looks like this one has some light wear. I mean, it's one of the cleaner ones that I've seen show up. And I'm not paying more than $2,250. <laughs> you should only be paying $3,000 if that goddess is mint. I mean, you gotta remember, these were only like, I think, $1,500 brand new. Nobody wanted them back then. But you could check out these episodes for more in-depth details. But this is another good one. Nick's Pro Gear Shop listed a couple of cool explorers. It's a camo explorer. A long time ago, I unboxed one of these. It was the 3P90 version, but I said, it's got the Kaler, so I'm gonna wait for the stop bar tailpiece. I regret not reviewing that guitar, but I also remember I was buried in guitars at that point. I understand why I sold it on. But these camo explorers, they're just, they're not my favorite, but they're part of Gibson history, so I definitely want one. But you can find the camo paint job on the Explorer 3, which is the P90 variation, and then the two humbuckers like we've seen here. So this is probably one of the more rare configurations right here. Now, now, finding one that doesn't have all the lines on it everywhere, impossible. That's, that's just how this finish is. And here's another thing. They all seem to get chipping around the tuners. Like, this was a fragile finish. But this one looks pretty clean as far as, you know, cleanliness in general. A little bit of stand rash. Beautiful puke green backside <laughs> to match your camo. Yeah, that's a pretty cool example. Stock Dirty Fingers pickups. But then he also listed Night Violet. That's the official color of this one, not Purple Burst. He wants 75 on this one. This is more of a stretch because this guitar is not quite as rare. Like it's still a desirable finish, but generally you can find these, you know, below 3,500. Like even that's a high amount. I generally suggest being between, you know, 25 to 3,000 on these. But this has got some, I, I would say a little bit more extreme than normal vertical finish checking. I would actually suspect that there might be some moisture your damage associated with this one but the alder bodies are pretty well known for doing the whole vertical finish checking but yeah yeah there, there you can see it that's definitely a little bit of moisture damage so perhaps this guy's not storing his guitars properly or this one wasn't stored properly before he got it and then lastly, at the beginning of the episode, I showed you this one. So it's just a regular Les Paul special from the original collection, but look at the wood grain on this puppy. Got a lot of ringage around here, and then you got the opposite of it over here. This is a fantastic example of a stock production level guitar. I call them extraordinary ordinaries. The back may be not as good as the front, but you got a cool mixture of stuff going on. Like if you were gonna buy one of these things anyways, you might as well get one with cool wood grain. Trust me, you're gonna thank your 
yourself in the future if you ever have to sell it because it's going to sell faster and potentially at a premium. But this color looks really off. It almost looks like they accidentally blent it with the olive drab green finish. But all right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed this guitar hunting session with me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.